Hey, 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 welcome into another episode of Halos in the Infield with your host, Todd Fox, and the other host, and Fernando Mendez. <laughs> <laughs> so, we also have a guest on the show today, and, and your name is, sir? Uh, uh, Rich. Uh, Rich. First time, first time caller, long time listener. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rich Waltz, the just uh, thrilled to be on the show. <laughs> the broadcaster for the Angels and has done much a uh, lot of broadcasting in his career. He's going to get into some of that. So, Fernando, you want to take this one away here? Absolutely. So, first of all, Rich, thank you. Uh, this has been a long time coming. Uh, I, we reached out to you, I believe, the day that uh, it became public that you were going to, uh, you know, come on board with Valley Sports West. So uh, thanks. We're glad that we're finally able to do it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we would have liked to do it earlier. It just, you know, life happens for all of us. You've been flexible with us. So thank you so much. I think last time I talked to you, I just got done throwing a uh, birthday party for my kids' stuffed fish. So <laughs> thanks for accommodating that. It was a big event in the household. What, what was the, what were the, uh, was there a cake, cupcakes? What, did, what kind of uh, refreshments do you have for a birthday party for a stuffed fish? Yeah, so uh, we went to an indoor playground in the in the yeah. morning called Candyland in Santa Ana. Shout out to them. That's not how they watch this. Yes, and then afterward, we came home to uh, my son's favorite meal, and apparently it's fishes, which is spaghetti and meatballs. That's and awesome. And then ended with some cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> did the fish go to Candyland too, or did... Uh... He did. He okay. did. He held on to him the whole time. Good. That's, awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. Nice. Yeah, dude, uh, I'm all kids. It's it's the best, right? I mean, it there's is. some moments where you're just like, man, I never thought I was going to do this in my life. I know. But you know what? Enjoy it while it lasts because there'll be a time, and I'm kind of at that time right now. I've got a 24 and a 20-year-old, 20, 20 mm -hmm. and, and you think back to that. You see kids doing stuff like that, and you think back to when you did it, and you're like, man, I, I just remember that being so much fun. And it's, yeah. it seems like it was yesterday, and it's it was 20 years ago. So. Enjoy it while you got it, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I'll, I'm very on record on the show saying that, like, I was 21 when I had my dream job. I wanted to be an animal trainer at SeaWorld. I got to do that. And, you know, I didn't get a sense of fulfillment. But I'll tell you what, and I'm sure you could agree, there's nothing like being a parent. If you want to be fulfilled in life, be a parent. It's, it's right. absolutely the coolest. It is. I mean, it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it can be scary. Um, but it's, it's totally worth it now when, you know, mine are young adults and that's a, that's a whole nother, uh, dimension, which is a great, great experience too. So, oh yeah, I'm, you know, here's hoping that one day, uh, you know, if you guys want, you guys get grandkids. I'm just, I hear that's like even better from what everything I hear. So I'm a, we'll I'm a see. long way, way. I don't, I'm not ready. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we're like, don't rush that. it. Don't rush it. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm just saying. One day, right. If it's in the cards, it's in the cards. All right. Well, let's get into it. So as I said, uh, you this was your first year on Valley Sports West. Uh, prior to coming over to the Angels and uh, calling some games for us, you were with the Miami Marlins from 2005 to 2017. Uh, and then after you also did some MLB Network and you currently cover uh, college sports as well. So, I mean, how, how is it juggling all that? How was it doing, you know, working for the Marlins? Maybe just kind of a brief overview of how you've enjoyed your career up to this point. It's great. Look, I get paid to go to games. Um, and really, I was not a broadcasting student. I didn't go to Syracuse. I was a, a college shortstop at UC Davis. And pre-law was my major. And I just decided and when I didn't get drafted that because uh, I obviously wanted to play in the big leagues. Um, that I had a burning desire to get to the major leagues. And I looked around and at that time, the, there really wasn't an avenue for someone that didn't play in the minors or in uh, major league baseball to do anything in major league baseball of consequence, be a general manager, um, be a farm director, be a manager, be a coach or whatever. That was before the, you know, the Theo Epstein's and the, and the guys came through the, the Ivy league type GM. So, you know, uh, talked my way into a minor league hockey job, then minor league hockey for three years. At the same time that led to minor league baseball, uh, did uh, two years of uh, single A, a year of double A, three years of triple A, all the while doing small college football and basketball and uh, got on television doing uh, Western Hockey League and events like that. That led to uh, the Seattle Mariners pre and post game on television, uh, fill in play by play role. 
ESPN saw one of my college games and hired me. I was at ESPN for five years doing college football uh, and Major League Baseball and college basketball and a bunch of other events that were uh, really cool. Um, wanted to be the voice of a team and kind of worked my way to the point where uh, I got the Marlins job in 2005 and was there for 13 years and had a great time. Still did a lot of college football, uh, college um, basketball for a variety of people, SEC, ACC, um, ESPN, Fox, uh, and then CBS hired me in 2014. I started doing football and basketball for them as well. Uh, all the while did some, you know, a lot of national games for uh, MLB Network and Fox. And, um, and then, you know, in 2017, uh, after the season, before 18 started, the ownership changed in Miami and a lot of people were, were shown the door, including me. Um, but I was really fortunate that a lot of people were, were, um, were great to me. Pick, a lot of people called right away and said, don't worry, we got games for you. Uh, CBS gave me more games. MLB Network said, don't worry, we're going to give you more. And they did too. I got to do some really cool stuff. I got to do uh, the um, NBA playoffs in, in, um, for Turner uh, in their virtual reality um, format, which is pretty cool. Um, I got to do uh, the NCAA uh, regionals um, for Turner as well in, the, in that same format. I got to fill in for the, the San Francisco Giants, which is just an incredible booth um, with Crook and Kite. So that was a, a real honor. I got to do the... Um, in the NCAAs um, in 2019 on ESPN, I got to do a regional and a super regional in leading up to the College World Series. And in fact, in the super regional, I got to call Kumar Rocker's uh, no hitter, the 19 strikeout no hitter, which was really cool. So look, I was uh, obviously disappointed that things uh, didn't go beyond 13 years in Miami, but on the same uh, side of the coin, uh, you have to look at, at all the cool things I never thought I would get to do and see and, and experience. Um, and I got to do Angels baseball for half a season this year. So uh, that's that's the Cliff Notes version of uh, or the shortened condensed version of, of my career. For anybody who's over there, uh, you know, wondering this, I'm like, oh, well, I hope you asked about this, this and this. Don't worry. I did my research. So we're we're diving into almost all of that. I mean, you know, all right. you, this is awesome. You, you've done a lot of cool stuff that I, you know, things I didn't even think about. I mean, you have obviously a very recognizable voice. Chances are. If someone's a sports fan, they know your voice. Whether they know you personally or not, they've heard you. Um, one thing that I want to ask about that I was kind of blown away by, you have three Emmys. Can, can yes. you tell me about that? Uh, the, you know, sometimes a blind squirrel finds a nut, or maybe three in this case. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, for my work with the Marlins. And um, there, it's bittersweet because – uh, you know, one was for uh, just plain old, you know, games. Uh, and the other two were for um, Jose Fernandez um, related uh, games, the, the, oh. the game after he uh, was killed. Um, and then the coverage that we had uh, on that Sunday that he died and um, and throughout the week with the funeral procession. And I anchored a lot of that. Um, which was incredibly sorrowful and, and hard. And, and then they gave you a trophy and it's like, you just like, really? Yeah. But, you know, um, so yeah, it's, um, I didn't even know when I, when I started in Miami, like the first five or six years, we never submitted anything. We never even thought about that. And um, you look, you're fortunate you win. Um, there's a lot of great people out there that, uh, were in the category and, and all of that. So uh, they're pretty cool. My kids didn't like the day they showed up, they send them to you in this big white box. And I, and they said, what's that dad? And I said, Oh, it's an Emmy. And they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> I said, well, open it, up. <laughs> open it up. And they open it up. They're like, wow. So yeah. Right. But you know, after a, after a while, they, they make a great doorstop, you know, <laughs> I'm not a memorabilia guy. I mean, this is my office and I don't think there's like maybe one signed thing in here. Um, I'm not a big memorabilia guy. What's that? Um, what's that Jersey behind you? Is that another Miami Jersey? Uh, uh... It is a throwback. Uh, the Marlins did a throwback uh, game in Milwaukee uh -huh. and um, it was a, so they dressed as the Marlins from the fifties 
which was a minor league team, a triple A team that played downtown and Satchel Paige played on that team. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's got a really cool old, old Marlin logo. It's sort of, it's not uh, wool, but it's kind of looks like wool uh, mm-hmm. and it's signed by the whole team. And, and uh, the team actually gave that um, to a couple of uh, us, uh, a couple of broadcasters for our work on a, a big charity event that, um, that I had down in Miami. And so uh, I was, you know, I don't have a lot of signed stuff, but I thought that was pretty cool that the, the club went to that uh, uh, had that gesture for us. And it's got, look, it's got, there are some cool signatures up there. It's the 2012 team, I think. So, you know, Stanton, Yelich, Ozuna, uh, Carlos Lee was on that team. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, so, you know, and I needed something to put on the wall. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Way it, worked. it was nice and big. So it, it, you know, took a big, big spot on the wall. I had a real quick question. Um, going back to what you were saying after what happened, uh, you let go of Miami. The fact that you had all that love, from different networks hitting you up, did that give you sort of an appreciation of your overall uh, job as, as what you've done as a broadcaster being known that maybe you weren't thinking that that many people uh, knew of you or appreciated your work, but the fact to get that love right away and people saying, Hey, we got you. How how good did that make you feel? It it was uh, incredibly uplifting and it, it helped. I don't want to say it saved me, but, um, you know, I thought I was going to be in Miami forever and in the community and in the booth and all of that, uh, by all accounts, really successful. And, um, you know, I still have a deep connection with the fans down there. Mm-hmm. I still get a lot of stuff, you know, from fans, which is great. Um, and look, everybody goes through this, I think, in life, whether it's a broadcaster or a insurance salesperson or a student or an athlete where things all of a sudden change and by no um, uh, no result of your work uh, you lose your job and um, you know the thing that really helped me was you know the, the first you know the first night after it happens because it was an absolute total blindside surprise you're really mad and angry and bitter, but then you wake up the next morning and you're like, you know what, there's nothing I can do to change it. And I'm not going to be the bitter guy uh, moving forward. Um, No one wants to hire a bitter guy. Right. Um, But a lot of the, a lot of these people I had done some stuff for. um, So they knew me and they knew my work and um, you know, just the flood of calls that came in from uh, network executives and, and, other teams, uh, other broadcasters, um, your peers, uh, guys that uh, you really respect um, and, and don't expect to reach out, and they do. That was the big you know, push. And there's been a lot of people that have helped push you forward in your career before that. And then there have been many that in the last two, three years that have helped push me forward and, and, uh, and, and look out for me. Um, So, yeah, it's look, that's the you don't and and, it reinforced to me the type of person that I want to be, because I've always been one of those people when somebody gets uh, in a situation like that or, you know, they're down or, you know, that it's um, unfair and all of that. You pick up the phone, you 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 reach out and you, you know, you give them a pep talk and then and then you look out for them. Anything I can do to help you, let me know. And it's when that comes back to you in spades or waves or whatever you want to call it. uh, It is really cool. And, and I'm, you know, I'm really lucky that a lot of people were looking out for me. That's nice. What goes around comes around in a good way, you know? Yeah. Well, I, uh, you hope so. Yeah. All right. So you were with the Marlins for, you know, over a decade. So, you know, Miguel Cabrera, Luis Castillo, Dontrell Willis, Giancarlo Stanton, like those are just to name a couple of the players. I mean, you saw some real studs play in Miami. Yep. So one of those guys was Giancarlo Stanton. You yep. were on the call during one of the absolute farthest home runs that I have ever witnessed on television. And I replayed that call probably like 10 times this morning. So I want to ask you, What was going through your mind when Giancarlo Stanton literally hit a home run out of the ballpark? And this wasn't Tiger Field. You know, back in the old days, when the stadiums were, you know, stacked 
You know, it's a lot easier to hit a ball out. But well, the um, I'm not sure. Look, I've uh, he had that great season when he hit 59. That was an incredible yeah. ride. Um, you're probably talking about the Dodger Stadium, the one he hit out of Dodger Stadium, um, correct? Which, which was it was a hard home run to call because it was twilight and and it it was early in the game, so it was still light. But at that moment at twilight, it's hard to find the ball. Um, but you could tell as soon as he hit it that it was going a long way. And then I watched it, and as it came down towards the roof, I went from roof to fans in the seats because yeah. then you're looking for the ball to land because you lose it in the roof. And everyone in the seats went like this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they were looking out the back because it had gone over. And so if you, if, you, um, if you listen to that call, it's really cool because – my partner in, in Miami was Tommy Hutton, and, and Tommy is just a dear friend and a great analyst and a former Dodger. He was scouted by Lasorda, played for Lasorda, and, and, and was a, just a, a you know highly decorated on, one, on the best minor league team ever in baseball, the Spokane Indians. I believe it was 71, and then had a really nice major league career. So Tommy knew Dodger history. And the ball leaves the yard, and I was fortunate to call it and send it out of the yard and react appropriately. And Tommy waited a beat and just picked it up, and he named, like, the three or four guys, Stargell, um, Piazza, or whoever else the, the guys were that hit the home runs out. He just named them, this guy, that guy, this guy. And that's it, folks. Those are the only people to do it, and now Giancarlo Stanton has done it. So that was a really cool uh, moment to share with your analysts. Um, uh, you then, know, look, the Stan home run, if there's a, um, you can find it online. Uh, MLB, I think now film room or whatever they call it has got like all 59 of his home runs from 2016. And, um, or is it 17? I, uh, anyways, the year he had 59. And I went back uh, and listened to that. And I was like, every time he hit it, you're just like, man, I just, I've never seen the ball come off a bat like that. No, you know, exit velocity, he's, he still leads everybody in that category. And that, that yeah. year was just a magical ride uh, because, and it was a lot like Otani. That, it reminded me of what Otani did this year. Uh, because you get to August and you're thinking, is he, man, this guy could hit 40. And then, after he does that it's like this guy could hit 50 and it was the same with Stanton you were just going to you know he this guy could get to 50 and then in the you know final three weeks you're going he, he could get to 60 and he almost did yeah um yeah so yeah the, that's um uh, there's plenty of balls that he hit that you just were just on uh, you know your mouth was open I learned early the first few times I saw him play you learned that the, when it came off the bat you're you're a you know, you're experienced enough that you know, all right, that's going to be to the warring track, but that's going to be to deep center. With him, you always added like 30 feet. It always went 30 or 40 <laughs> feet farther than you thought it was going to go. And once you got that instinct down, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty clean from there. <laughs> so right. short answer for this then, like when uh, there's, is there moments like that home run where like something will happen and literally everyone in the booth just is like, Oh my gosh. Like people like legitimately freak out because it was one of those moments. Yes, absolutely. And that happens in other sports too. Uh, a yeah. big buzzer beater in basketball. I've had a couple of big hail Marys in, in college football. Uh, even this year with, with Gooby in the booth uh, with Otani, uh, whether it's a home run, I remember he pulled a home run early in the games that I was doing and just to hit it to a place that Joe Madden said he'd never seen a ball hit in Angel Stadium, down the right field line, up into the seats, uh, above the tunnel and the walkway, way up there. The State Farm sign right above that? Yeah, and so it's like when something like that happens, you call it, and, and there's astonishment in your voice, but there's also astonishment in your face. And you can turn and look <laughs> at your analyst, and he's turning and looking at you like, and... <laughs> And that's what everybody else, there's the, the, one of the best things about the Otani September and, and August, uh, we had, a, we have a terrific crew at Valley Sports. Max Leinwand is our, our producer. Mitch Riggin is a great director. And one of the things that they caught on to pretty quickly and, and were really good at 
was when Otani would hit a home run, they would find a kid in the stand. And that kid would be, you could see the kid during the at-bat up on his feet, hands on a rail, just like, I can't believe I'm watching Otani. And then the ball leaves the bat and it's like, and the ball goes out and the kid just loses his mind. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all of us, right? Whether we were kids, we were that way when we were kids, but even as adults. And there were so many moments like that where he would do something and, and Max and, and Mitch would have the shot of the crowd reaction of a kid reacting. And you're just like, I know what you're thinking, kid. I mean, I'm the same. It's the same feeling for all of us. So speaking of like memorable moments, you've gotten to call six no hitters, correct? Six major league no hitters. Uh, and then the one, the Kumar rocker no hitter with 19 yeah. strikeouts was in an elimination game in a super regional was pretty special too, but yes. So six major league uh, no hitters. So, you know, what's always been your rule? So if you're like calling a game, at what point do you maybe just casually notice, okay, this guy's throwing a no hitter. And at what point do you actually start talking about it? You know, obviously that's your job, but obviously yeah, you know, yeah. I think rule of thumb is usually once you get to the sixth inning, um, okay. because you know you can note it. Boy, this has been a uh, you know what a great performance here. He's shutting out um, the Red Sox, and they don't have any hits. That's kind of what you are in the fourth or the fifth inning. Once you hit the sixth, um, you're getting closer to single digit outs to get the no hitter. Mm -hmm. And it, look, I'm of the, I, I played in college. Uh, I've, I know that a lot of ball players, you know, and fans are like, you can't say it, you can't say it. But, you know, I always kind of follow Vin Scully. Uh, you know, what would Vin do in this situation? And yeah. Vin Scully was, it's a no hitter. He's got a no hitter through seven. The Dodgers have had 10 no hitters in their history uh, on to the ninth. And he's three outs from a no hitter. Um, they never went after Vince Scully, but you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, fans are like, oh, you idiot. You don't know anything about baseball. It's like, you know, that's my job. Here's the, here's the flip side of that. I know that you're sitting on the couch and some people are like, don't say it. I'm not moving from the couch. I can't leave all of that stuff. I get that. <laughs> I get that. But there are people that are tuning in this modern age around the, around the spectrum, looking for games and say they tune into a game. And it's three to nothing in the eighth inning. And they're like, ah, three nothing game. And the guy's pitching and he strikes a guy out. Guy hits a fly ball out. And the person says, ah, they're going to win this game. Let's go see what's going on in the football game. That's the yeah. person that you're serving in that situation. Um, you, you're, you have to alert people as to what's happening. You don't drive it into the ground and beat it to, you know, yeah, yeah. to death. But you have to inform people and you, you know, we have nothing to do with it. We, we're not, I get the players and, and, you know, the dugout decorum and stuff like that, but, you know, and, and I've been brought through network systems and, and, and even the teams that I've worked with the Mariners and the Marlins, I mean, and all those no hitters, I said, no hitter in the seventh inning. So, you know, people say, Oh, you jinx Sandoval. Right. <laughs> And you know, <laughs> I, I get to hit off the end of the bat. You know, it's like if I had just covered my, you know, if I had walked out of the booth in the ninth inning, the same thing would have happened. So, oh, yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's yeah. the social media side of the world now. You know, but I get it. That's OK. And that's but you, the, the thing you do is a, I, I get it because you respect and you desire mm -hmm. that kind of passion from the fan. You oh, want yeah, people yeah. to be invested. You want people to be emotional. You want people to be hanging on uh, on every pitch. Um, uh, so I, I get it. I, I understand it. I'm just I'm from a group and, and have been brought up um, by some of the, you know, counseled by some of the very best that this is your job. You say it. Got you. So you've covered your fair share of college sports including yep. Kumar Rocker's 19 strikeout no hitter. We've talked plenty about it already. Um, and as well as a lot of uh, college football games. In your opinion, what's the biggest difference between college sports and professional sports and, you know, calling each particular side? Well, 
I've, I've not done NFL regular season, but I've done plenty of preseason games. Um, NFL games are a lot easier to call because there's fewer players. There's less formation. There's less substitution. It's much more organized. I mean, we, when you do a college game, you get a roster of like 110 guys. Yeah. And there's probably yeah. 15 to 20 double numbers. So number three, the wide receiver is Smith. Number three, the linebacker is um, Jones. And good luck figuring out which one's on the special teams, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so NFL is much more, you know, they line up in almost the same formations as everybody. There's less gadgets. There's less moving parts. Um, it's, it's a cleaner game. Uh, but that's part of the allure to college football is the, the emotion, the band, uh, the craziness, the creativity. Uh, and that's, there's, it's much more, to me, dramatic and much more surprising when stuff happens in a college game than an NFL game. They're both great. Um, I'd love to call a, a NFL regular season game that's on, on the bucket list. And, um, uh, but those are from, from my experience doing NFL preseason games and a, a ton of college. Those are, I think, the difference in football. Basketball, the same, having done some of the NBA stuff. Um, NBA is much more um, up and down, faster. Things happen quicker. You have to be, if you're calling play-by-play -play of an NBA game, you have to be much more in front and much briefer with your short bursts of play-by-play. -play. Whereas college has a, a shot clock. Some teams are up-tempo and have an NBA feel to them. Others will come down and set something up. And, and, and go from there. Uh, baseball, the skill level in baseball is the thing that jumps out at you. You'll be doing a, you know, I have not done a lot of college baseball and it had been 20, 30 years since I'd played before I did those ESPN games. But um, your first reaction sometimes like a ball in the hole is like, how does he not make that play? And then you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's college baseball. These guys are, these are single A players. And that's when I, that's one of the benefits I think of coming up through the minor leagues is you understand the progression of a player, a great college player in, in high A it generally needs a couple, maybe three years before he's ready to play and play well in the major leagues. And you can see it. I was two years, double A, a year, or two years, single A, a year, double A, three years, triple A. You can see the progression because there were, guys that I saw in single A and then guys in double A and the same guys in triple A. And you're like, Oh, I get it. Three years, bigger, stronger, and much more skilled um, before they got to the big leagues. Uh, it, it, funny. What I, what you were answering the first portion, you kind of answered my next question. Cause I was like, Oh, I was going to ask, I'm not a big college sports guy. What, what do you got for me? And then you talked about the excitement and all that. I was like, well, there you go. There goes that question. Yeah. <laughs> he's already kind of, he's answering before I can even ask. Well, all right. Well, go I ahead, got a go. couple of Marlins questions before we move on any, any further off the Marlins. Uh, <laughs> I want to no ask problem. you your favorite, your favorite uh, jerseys and least favorite rich, because they've gone through a few designs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'd go back to the, the, uh, the teal and black with the fish, uh, Okay. behind the f the miguel cabrera uh dan ugla hanley ramirez the playoff Josh run and uh cody ross yeah i like those unis i didn't mind the new ones that came out in 12 because the team was really fun to follow you had stanton yelich ozuna logan morrison was a young guy jose fernandez um JT Real Muto, guys like that. So yeah. sometimes the team overcomes the uniform. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and um, I, I, I grew to like those, but I think, I think everybody liked the, um, the teal pinstripe, uh, yeah. Jeff Ponine, Miggy Cabrera, Mike Lowell, um, all those guys. And Dontrell Castillo, Louis Castillo was just a, what a fun player to be around. Um, an incredible, uh, you know, multiple time gold glove winner. Mm -hmm. uh, I think an underrated guy, certainly because he played in Miami, even though he played 
in the postseason, played well and won a World Series. The Marlins at that time were still, you know, under uh, exposed in, in, on a national scale. Louis Castillo was a, uh, just a fabulous player. I think the Marlins had that team been around now with the way social media is, they would have gotten a lot more love. I mean, that was yes. a very, very fun team to watch. Those unis were epic. Uh, you yeah. know, th- it was just a, it was a great team to watch. They were never, uh, never give up, never surrender type team. Also, one thing: what were your thoughts about the sculpture at at the at the stadium? The home run sculpture. <laughs> the home run sculpture. Yeah. The home run sculpture. <laughs> if you here's the deal: if um, I grew up in California mm-hmm. and then uh, went to school at UC Davis, so that's California, and then jumped into climbing through the minor leagues and uh, was in Spokane, Washington, Wichita, Kansas, and then Las Vegas. Uh, when I moved to Miami, it's Miami's like no other place in the country in terms of culture, uh, topography, beaches, nightlife, mm-hmm. um, art, weather, and, and weather, all of that stuff. It, yeah. And it was, I really enjoyed it. I loved living on the East Coast just to see what it was like. Because you grow up a sports fan on the West Coast and people talk about the East Coast bias and how oh, they know or appreciate it out here. And so to go back east and live in back east, I can remember the first night uh, uh, in like sep- first September night I was there. Uh, I, I, we had an off night and I was going to watch Monday night football. And I got sat on the couch at, at uh, six o'clock and I turned the TV on and it's like the news was on. I'm like, well, where's Monday night football? <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, it's on at nine o'clock here. Yeah. And then the world then in, came October and the playoffs and. The Marlins in 2005, my first year, were good. They still had Cabrera and, and Lowell and all those guys. Didn't make the playoffs. So I was like, I'm going to watch the playoffs. Same deal. It's, it's you know, game starting at 9, 30, 10 o'clock because it's on the West Coast or whatever. And it's, you know, 12.45 at night. And you're, you're like, oh, my God, I don't know if I'm going to make it here. Yeah. And, yeah. and you understand right there. You're like, okay, I get it. I see how teams drop off people's radar that are on the west coast simply because of the time difference mm-hmm. um yeah so i didn't i didn't even remember the question on that one. i just oh, oh, is this a sculpture your, your thoughts oh, the sculpture yes okay. so my point is if you <laughs> lived in miami uh that the ballpark opened in 12 if you lived in miami for like six seven years like i did you've been downtown you had been into the art district You'd been to South Beach. You'd been out all over the place. Um, you'd been to Key West. All these really mystical, uh, fun places. That sculpture fit right in. Oh, okay. It, it really okay. did. It, it fit in with the culture, with kind of the, I don't want to say art deco, but kind of the, the, the modern art that was around the city, mm-hmm. um, which is a, and Miami especially, but South Florida to, to some extent, but really Miami is such a colorful city. You, like I had moved from the Northwest where every car is either black, gray, dark, mm-hmm. every, you go to Nordstrom's and, and you, you know, the color, you know, it's be hard to find a shirt like this because everything's there. gray and drab. Yep. You walk into Nordstrom's or a, st- a clothing store in Miami and it's, pop 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 colors bright colors like the shirt that you've got on uh i'm not that is a red shirt you 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 see stuff on the shelves and stores and and everything in miami and people are wearing colors and it's vibrant it's just the culture there and that was part of that home run sculpture as well and it it got to be fun especially with guys that hit a lot of home runs that thing go off and the water (laughs) stood out and yeah i'll always remember that the the irony of it was um, Dan Ugla hit a ton of home runs for the Marlins in the old stadium and in the new stadium. He was, um, he got traded, but I think he signed as a free agent. Um, Marlins offered him, but they couldn't offer him as much as the Braves offered him. And so the Braves signed him and, and Dan had three, I think three, maybe three and a half really good years with the Braves came back to Marlins park. And like the second home run he hit there against them like hit right in the middle of the sculpture and it hit with a giant clang and the ballpark was just like quiet because it was ugly hitting a home run. And um, I just remember him 
jogging around the bases with this big smile on his face like yeah i hit this i hit the sculpture <laughs> that's pretty awesome oh yeah. one other question since you went to the east coast uh i have a couple friends that went over there they were amazed the fact that it's like with all the the teams they've had run through there with the heat winning championships you know the dolphins being the dolphins the you know marlins winning world series tampa bay being you know always in the playoffs and, and world series contention it's is it true is it really more of a college type nascar fan base like like that gets a little bit more pushed than the major sports that's what i've heard maybe more so out of miami um you know when i arrived there the the Hur miami hurricanes were still a big deal yeah. um they've kind of fallen off of that now Florida the heat State. have had you know the heat were just getting good mm -hmm. and had have, have still continued amazingly uh, just a really incredible run of nba championships and success Um, I think like any pro sports town though, and Miami is a great example, um, down there, they have to win, uh, the heat, if the heat weren't any good, <laughs> they wouldn't have had all that success of, at the gate. The dolphins used to be the toughest ticket to get in town. Mm -hmm. That's changed because they've been in, in a drought for a long time. Um, and Tampa Bay's baseball stadiums in a bad spot. It's hard to judge the two Miami teams. Um, you know, it, the the ballpark's not in Tampa. It's across the water. It's a yeah. terrible drive from at five o'clock at night on, on a summer night. The traffic is thick, and there's lightning storms, and it's you know raining cats and dogs. It's a miserable drive from Tampa over to St. Pete. So it's really hard to blame the fans or or f figure out if if they had a ballpark in t in Tampa if it would be great in Miami's. I think Miami, the Marlin fan base is not great, but they're, they're great at heart. There's, there's really hardcore fans there and loyal fans, but I think they just got so fatigued with build up, tear down, build up, yeah. tear down. And, you know, teams that had a chance to get there, didn't get there and they started over again. And that's, I think that fatigues a fan base. So it's a different, my, I think Miami and, and Florida is a lot different than the East Coast North when you get into the Northeast mm -hmm. or even uh, up in Atlanta as well. Yeah, because I think, what, like you said, weather plays a role and then you have so much to do down there. There's a lot of options as well. But, yeah, Southern California's got that issue too. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, calling games at the Big A on a Sunday afternoon, um, you realize how beautiful it is in all the other places. And, and you know, you get 30, 35,000 in there and you're like, that's a good crowd for a Sunday where, you know, there's the team's not in contention and you're going to, um, there's, you know, the beach is 20 miles that way and the mountains are an hour that way and um, all that. So, but that's great. I mean, that's, I grew up in, the, in a similar area in uh, Northern California. So I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. All right, so a couple of last quick minute, uh, minute questions here. And once again, thank you so much for the time. So walk me through the 2021 Angel season from your eyes, uh, from what you got to witness. What's the one thing you think you're going to remember in you know 10 years or whenever your career is over and you really get to reflect back? What are you going to remember about this season with the Angels? Well, I think it depends on, well, look, I mean, from this season, it's Otani, right? I think everybody's never seen anything like that. And in, if I'm around in 50 years and fortunate enough to have grandchildren or great grandchildren at that point, that's going to be a number one. I saw Tani play. It would be the same as somebody in the 70s or the 80s saying, or even now saying, I saw Babe Ruth play. Um, I was there when Babe Ruth called his shot, stuff like that. So, you know, the, the headline is Otani. The, the season, the thing that I'll remember first is the kindness um, that Mark Gubaza and Jose Moda showed me mm -hmm. when I showed up because it, there wasn't a lot of runway uh, before my landing. It was a phone call. Can you come? We'd like you to come do some games and uh, three or four days to prepare. And, and I knew Jose from the minor leagues. Um, Jose was a, uh, a was coming up through the Padres system when I was a broadcaster in Wichita and in Las Vegas. So he and I have been friends and have kept in touch. So uh, that was the fact that he was there and he's just such a um, incredible human being. 
Um, and then Kubi was just the best, you know, what do you need? You know, it's, um, if you're accepted by Gooby, I think that gives you cachet to uh, a lot of Angel fans and, and with, uh, understandably, as, you know, as revered, and he should be, as, as Gooby is. So that's the first thing that sticks out is the, you know, the way the organization, the way Bally, uh, and, and especially those two guys, uh, Jose and, and Gooby, made me feel in the booth, um, which allowed me to be myself. Um, as a whole, you know, I think for Angel fans, if you look at this season, um, you hope that you look back and you remember uh, the year that uh, Jared Walsh backed up 2020. You know, 60-game season, a lot of doubters. Eh, he can't do it over a full season. He did it over a full season. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, you know, you hope that it's like, remember that year when when Marsh and Adele got here just about the same time and they're they're such good friends and then you know, Adele hit that grand slam in Detroit and Marsh had that great series where he was doubling into left center field, racing around the bases with no helmet, diving in head first, all that stuff. Um, you hope that it's like, remember that year where uh, Fletch won his first gold glove? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Uh, and then that's what you hope when you look back at this season in terms of, of Angel's history, that it was the start of something. Look, once Rendon and Trout uh, left with injuries, uh, the team really had no legitimate shot at getting to the postseason. Mm -hmm. To be at 500, I thought, for as long as they were, was pretty amazing with the lineup that they, you know, at times had to run out, even with Walsh out for that, uh, that time. Um, and you hope it's a, a, you know, you look back and say, this is the year that Patrick Sandoval took a big step forward. Yep. And that was the start of his nice run. Um, this is the um, this was the year that Suarez um, finally felt like, hey, he belonged. That Berea didn't get sent down eighty times up and down, and and got his feet on the ground and 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 got going and, and stuff like that. So, um, but obviously the Otani uh, stuff. I think the other thing that stood out to me this year was finally getting to call games for a Joe Madden team, which is really cool to me because I always really liked him a lot, admired him a lot. He was, he's the type of manager that for a visiting broadcaster, you can walk in his office and he knows your name and you can sit and talk. And the next time you come talk to him, he remembers where you're from and where, you know, all of that. And he used to just beat the daylights out of the Marlins when he was the Rays manager, <laughs> first and third bunts. <laughs> you know, always pinch hitting and, and rotating guys in. Zobrist was always getting, you know, three hits and playing a different position. And, um, the Uptons were there and all that stuff. And then we was in Chicago, we would play them uh, a couple times a year. And uh, I remember that he, uh, there was a night, I, I had a big charity event in Miami uh, and it was a, a, an event that happened during a game, a, a live auction and telephone type stuff. It's really cool. And we got stuff from all over, um, you know, that fans just couldn't get um, by themselves, uh, buy at a store, like the, the team socks or the, the wristbands from Father's Day and stuff like that. And so okay. I remember walking into Joe's office and um, the Cubs were the opponent. We had a Cubs package because Anthony Rizzo was from down there and he was great. He gave us a, a signed bat and a uniform. Um, we got a couple other things from uh, Cubs players. Joe Madden was sitting in there and he, he had seen the advertisements on the TV. And he, he, when I walked in, he said, Hey, you're having a big event tonight. He said, what, what is, what else, what have you got? And I started talking and then I told him, Hey, Rizzo gave us this. We got a Cubs thing. We've got a night for, uh, you know, two in Chicago with tickets to uh, rooftop seats to Wrigley. And he goes, well, what can I do? And he was wearing that, that shirt that was so popular in Chicago that said, try not to suck with the, with the glasses, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which was all from his charity, but, correct? Yeah. Yeah. For his charity. And it was, but he'd been wearing this the whole year and, and this one shirt he had, this was his gamer and he hadn't, um, and it was kind of beat up, which made it even better. And so he said, well, how about I give you this shirt after the game? So, you know, we, we had the camera come in, take a picture of him with the shirt. And we threw it into that Cubs package and the Cubs package went for like $7,000 uh -huh. trip to Wrigley, 
you know, rooftop seats, tour, Rizzo stuff, Joe Madden shirt. Just the, awesome. and and sure enough, as after the game was over, he took the shirt off, signed it, and and handed it over. And and there was some Cub fan that lived in my, in Florida that that has it. And just for him to take the uh, the interest and rec- recognize that, and um, you know, literally give the shirt off his back for that was really cool. So I remember showing up the first day for the first time in in, in the dugout and. You know, I walked in with an angel polo on and Joe looked at me and it was like, hey, I know you. And that was really cool. And the, awesome. the, the best thing for a broadcaster in any sport, if you're following that team, is to have a great relationship with the manager. Mm-hmm. And I've been really lucky. Miami, I just had a bunch of great, you know, Jack McKean, Freddie Gonzalez, Don Mattingly, all great uh, relationships with those guys. Um in Seattle, I hosted the Lou Pinella show for, um, there was a picture of my shoulder of, of me and Lou. Uh, for 10 years, I was the host of the Lou Pinella show. Every night on TV, it's three minutes, me and Lou. And it was great. And it was fun. And it was crazy. And it, Lou would go nuts and be mad. And <laughs> then he'd start to cry, <laughs> talking about Buner and Griffey and his, the players he loved. So the best thing you can have is a, is, is a great relationship with your manager or if it's another sport, a head coach. because you can talk about your team that mm. you're calling the games for through that manager or through the hitting coach. That's another important relationship through the pitching coach. That's a big relationship to have because it's, it's one thing for an announcer to sit up there and say, boy, Fletch is really struggling here. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Everybody can look at the stats. Everybody watches the games. Why is he struggling? How is he trying to pull out of it? What's the path for him to get out of it? Go talk to Jeremy Reed and and get his opinion on it. What are you working on? Well, we're working on this drill. Here's what the struggle is. Um, I I think that's really important as as a local announcer or the team's announcer is that you give people the perspective of the manager, the coach, whatever, um, just so that they can play along with you. And, and look for, well, uh, you know, even Otani. I remember when Otani was going, was struggling. We talked to uh, Jeremy Reed and, and the hitting group. Um, and there were certain things to look for. Is he going to take a walk? Is he going to hit a ball to left center? And sure enough, he took a few walks. He hit a ball. He hit, it was a game where he hit two hard line drive outs to center field. And you knew right away that he was out of it. You knew right away he was going to have a good week. And sure enough, he homered the next day and, and had a good week. But if you don't go down and ask those people, the, the people that are there with them in the trenches, what they're working on or what are the signs, you never would have known it. it, it I think it makes for a, a, a better telecast and it makes a, a broadcaster's job easier to have those types of relationships. I think you hit the nail on the head right there because as fans, I mean, the casual fans maybe won't pick up on that, but the ones that are watching Bally's on a nightly basis, the ones that follow this team for years can see the fact that like, that's why we wanted to talk to you too, Rich, is because you had such a great relationship. Like you said, with Moto, Moto's being a real nice guy and everything else like that. Very knowledgeable about the game. Same thing with Gooby. When you guys are in the booth working together, he's like the Tony Romo of baseball. Like, like he can break down certain yeah. things before they happen. And yeah. then the way the way yeah. you and him played off each other was awesome this year. And and the points that you brought up about talking to the coaches before the game, getting the scouting reports or, or talking to Joe, it, it shows in the telecast because like when certain situations, you guys nail it. And, and then you're like, oh, okay. And it gives us as fans water cooler talk to be like, oh, you know what they mentioned the other day is this is what's happening with Otani. That's why he's not doing it. It's pretty cool. I mean, you guys do it, did a really good job this year. I appreciate that. And it's, but look, it's for me, it's curiosity because when I was coming through the minor leagues, I had just finished playing in, in college and I had, I, I spent a lot of time with the minor league managers I had asking them questions, asking the infield instructors about stuff. And I remember oftentimes I, I, I'd learned something and I'd, I'd be like, damn, I wish I knew that when I was playing two years ago, you know, backhand at short, you want to catch the ball in the, this way. It's like, and look, it, it's, it's not just the, the, the coaches, but you have to have that same relationship with players too. I, mm-hmm. It was harder this year than it was in years past for me because of COVID. You mm-hmm. couldn't really go into the locker room. 
You couldn't really get to, um, you hang out behind the cage in batting practice. So you, there was interactions with players um, as well. I, I had great conversations with the uh, uh, Mayfield and Walsh. You know, it was really cool when, um, when the Yankees came in that Yankee series because Rizzo came in. Mm -hmm. Rizzo was with the Yankees. I remember talking to Jared about uh, Rizzo in, in terms of defense, because I had heard somewhere from somebody that that was a guy he really looked up to. And he had just great stories about spring training. And uh, because the Angels and the Cubs were at the time where Rizzo was playing uh, together in Arizona and how he would just pick his brain on positioning and footwork and glove work and, and, and all of that. And Brian Butterfield, who's the infield instructor, you know, I went to him first and I said, okay, so tell me about Walsh's journey as, uh, as a first baseman defensively. And what if you were, and he just talked about, here's the things that we've, we've worked on. Here's the things he's getting better at. Here's the things that he's really good at. And he said, and the guy across the diamond is kind of his uh, template. He's the guy Rizzo. And so um, I remember going to, to Walsh then and say, so tell me what, what it is about Rizzo that you attracts you. And obviously, you know, uh, left-handed, he, he, it was great. He just took him through the, all the footwork, all the things that Rizzo does so well is so aggressive at first base. Um, that was really cool. And, and um, so I think the first thing you have to have is you've got to have that curiosity. Um, I remember asking Butterfield about Jack Mayfield because you know, Mayfield had a, I think, had a really nice season, had some big, big moments and proved that he can be a valuable guy uh, because he can play shortstop. And he played mostly third base. But, you know, Butterfield told me, no, he's a better shortstop than a third baseman. Um, and, and I said, so why is he better at short than a third? And he said he's better when the balls hit and when he can attack a ball at an angle. He's really, really good at that. And I think and, and that the little light bulb went on in my head because. I remember watching Mayfield for a month. He was great when he had to leave his feet. There was that one series in, um, was it Detroit? Where was that? Where he, he, he robbed, oh, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. He robbed like, um, he, I forget the hitter, but he robbed them like three times of a hit with a diving play to his right. Oh, yeah, the, the third, same, the third baseman. The same, yeah. yeah, in the same game at third base. Yeah, Diving to his left, diving to his right. Josh Donaldson? Yeah, it was Donaldson. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was. It was Donaldson. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then he had a series uh, where there were balls hit right at him at third, and he he bobbled them and and kind of kicked them. And when I asked Butterfield about it, he said he's better at short because he can attack a ball at an angle. He said for any infielder, third base is different because it's more here as a as like a goalie than as an infielder where you can take a route and go through the ball. And it was like then you watch them do their drills and all of a sudden you, you see them get better at it. And it's like, all right. So that's a good story that you can use at some point, especially later when, when um, they let Iglesias go and Mayfield was playing shortstop. All of a sudden you're like, yeah, I see this. I mean, he's better attacking balls at an angle than he is, you know, balls at him or immediately to his left. Not that he's not going to get better at that in his career, but, that's what happens when you go talk to the, the infield coach. You get great stories like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he made some great plays. Uh, so this one, uh, I'm just going to hit you with it. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. So I'm hoping that this one, you can just quick, quick response. Is Shohei Otani the most talented baseball player you've ever seen? Yes, without question. Okay. Um, and I've seen, you know, Griffey and, and Ichiro and Cabrera and oh, you've seen Stanton, some Hall of Famers. Stanton you've seen some and, future and Hall of Famers. Guys like that. He's just nobody does what he does and can do or has ever been able to do what he has done. I don't know how long he's going to be able to do it, but I'm I'm of the Joe Madden school where let's just enjoy it while we have it and and see how far he can take you. And dang, if he didn't take take the Angels, <laughs> you know, pretty far on his shoulders um, this year. Yeah. I mean, as as Absolutely. a as a guy with a whip of around one, 20, what is it, 23 starts or so, and, and an ERA right around three, and all the home runs he's hit in a pitcher's park, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I've been watching the Angels for years. If there's one thing I never took for granted, it was watching, you know, some of the players that we get 
to watch every single day. You know, people give us Angels fans a hard time about like, oh, well, you guys don't make the playoffs, blah, 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 blah. But I'll tell you what, man, I go to sleep every single day knowing that I just watched Mike Trout play. And unfortunately, this year, we didn't get to see too much of that. But we did get to see Shohei Otani do something that seemed superhuman. You know what I mean? Something where if I tried to do that in a video game, I feel like the video game would have just crashed. You know, it was unbelievable the kind of yeah. stuff we saw this year. It's unhuman. It really was. Yeah, like remember when you were in like third grade and, and you went to the library and there were books about a mythical player coming into the, you know, like, you know, the best player ever. And this was the guy that hit a thousand in high school and pitched the no hitter and he went on to the big leagues. <laughs> it's like that never happens. Um yeah. It happened, man. It's it's uh it's really fun. And and the hope is obviously. Uh, that Rendon and, and, and Trout are healthy and that, um, you know, all the young pitching that they've compiled take some steps forward, that the young players that played this year, uh, that got their opportunities, mm -hmm. take a step forward. Uh, the young pitchers that got opportunities, uh, Sandoval, uh, Berea, Suarez, um, those guys that they take a, a, a big step forward, Austin Warren, people like that. Because, um, you know, you, look, if – one of the things that if you look objectively at the lineup and I think a lot of people did once, you know, those two guys were out and, and Joe was trying to piece it together. One of the things that I think the angels lacked in their lineup was on base percentage. Yeah. And, and yep. it's like when every time I did a game with uh, against Houston or Oakland, it's like, I remember writing in my scorebook, I always write, batting average, home run, RBI, stolen bases, doubles. And then I'll write on base slugging, um, especially for, you know, the, the better players. And I just remember the, the Astros and the A's one through like six in their lineup all had an on base percentage of like 350. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I didn't really talk a whole lot about it, but I remember thinking to myself, you know, the angels could use some of that. And then I, then it's like, it dawned on me, Oh, they have that. I mean, Trout's career on base percentage is over 400. I think Rendon's is like 370. You plug them yeah. into the lineup, suddenly there's your on base percentage and your sluggy, and, and the cool. guys around him probably, you know, improve as well. That's what you hope. I mean, for a guy like Marsh is, is going to be. Um, I had a, a, a very similar experience watching Christian Yelich in his first year uh, in Miami. You know, kind of raw, left handed bat, a little gangly. Um, had some speed and was a gap to gap line drive, spray the ball all over the place type guy. Um, the thing that was similar between Yelich and, and Marsh is their um, mastery of the strike zone as a young player. The, the, it was really weird when, when Yelich got into the league, like his first three or four weeks, every time he complained about a strike and as, as a guy three weeks into the league, he didn't really complain. But every time you saw him look back like that's not a strike and didn't say anything, he was right because you look on the box and it was out by that much. And it's like, man, I've never seen a young player that knows the strike zone as well. I remember like the first two or three weeks of March was the same deal. I mean, I think his first major league at bat, he got rung up on a pitch outside. Um, uh, Joe West, I think. Um, <laughs> but his mastery of the strike zone was uh, really exceptional. And that's a, I think a really good sign uh, for his future. Speaking of Marsh real quick, I just want to follow up on that. My last question to you is uh, I watched a lot of, uh, I've been watching angels baseball since 86. And I gotta, I gotta say with watching the way that you're just talking about how Marsh was reminds me a lot of when Darren Erstad came up, he was a that's saint. A good comp. Yeah. I, I, I saw him take pitches, like you said, described, looked back, was never disrespectful to the umpire, but just kind of like nodded his head, like, okay, got that for next time. And he would adjust. He was a gamer. And the way that he plays center field Marsh, it reminds me a lot of Darren Erstad again. And and the way he's like goes all out, has a speed, high socks, takes pitches, line drive type of hitter. You know, Erstad only had a couple of years where he put up, you know, home run type numbers. But he was the kind of guy that, you know, hit you about maybe seven to 10 homers, 63, you know, 80 RBIs, something like that, with a high on base percentage. Do you see him maybe em emulating that into his game or becoming sort of like a Darren Erstad 2.0? Oh, yeah, you hope so. 
I mean, it, look, it, I mean, I don't know that Marsh punted as well as, uh, as <laughs> but uh, right. yeah, I mean, look, look, that's a great uh, bar to shoot for is to, is to have a career like that. It's it, 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 sometimes when you take a player from that era and, and a player from this era and compare them, it's, I think it's warranted in style and, and stuff like that. But I think if Erstad played now and if Marsh played then, um, you wonder if a guy like Erstad would have adjusted his swing because, you know, everybody's trying to hit home runs. That's how you get paid. And that's how teams have set up their offense. Mm -hmm. There were guys that played in, in Erstad's era um, or even back just, you know, 15, 20 years ago that were just line drive hitters. And that's, that was their yep. thing. Um, so yeah, man, if you, if you could be there, if you toss him, um, <laughs> I, but I think you could be that guy. I mean, I, the, the other thing about Marsh and we focus so much on his swing was center field in the major leagues is really hard to play. It's mm -hmm. like shortstop in the major leagues. Yeah. You don't see too many rookie catchers, shortstops or center fielders who step right in and look like they've been there for a while. And from the very start in center field, Marsh was like, man, this guy looks like he's been playing center field in big leagues for a long time. Exactly. He got great jumps. He took great angles. He knew when to dive for a ball and when not to. Um, he made some catches at the wall. Um, he, he, you know, he was gap to gap with speed and bursts and angles and all of that. And that's really impressive. And in, in his very first taste of it, to walk right in and have the manager have enough confidence to say, yeah, He's our center fielder right now. He's he's you're out there every day, kid. Just go get him. Um, that doesn't happen a lot. Um, and to see him do that is a again, I think that's just a great sign. That's the other thing about Adele, too. Uh, this is the first time I've seen him. I didn't see Adele up close when he came up and didn't have success. Yeah. Um, except for some home runs where he's, you know, because I remember Joe when Adele got up, Joe in the dugout saying, Someone asked him, well, what did you tell him going down that he had to work on? And Joe had literally had a checklist, better jumps, better reads uh, in the outfields, uh, more accurate throwing, better command of the strike zone, um, you know, sharper base running instincts, stuff like that. And um, it looked like Adele had really polished all of those um, yep. in the time that I got to see him. And I, you know, listening to a couple of his interviews and then listening to him talk in the dugout, he he had the same checklist. Yeah. I worked on this. I did this. I, I did that. You know, the instructors in the minor leagues were, were all on board with the same thing. So it's, it's really cool to see a player um, come to the big leagues, which a lot of them do struggle, go back down, make adjustments and then come back a, a different player with, with uh, armed with what they know they need to be armed with to be successful. Yeah, because he, you could tell, like defensively, uh, he struggled last year big time. But I think a lot of people did. I think we wrote up that year off because of everything that happened with COVID. But to see how he came back, like I forget what game he made that catch in short left field or against the wall, and mm -hmm. to see his reaction, how pumped yeah, up he was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that fired up a lot of people and that kind of vindicated himself because that was a knock that a lot of people said, you know, he defensively is a liability, but he was not a liability this year. You're absolutely right. He took a lot of pitches, whereas it seemed like last year he was always 0-2, 0-2, And uh, boy, he, he really settled in. It's just a shame he got injured towards the end, but he was finding his home run swing, too, because he started yep. out a little yep. slow. But uh, but but yeah, I, I think it was really encouraging to see those two guys maturate over the season. And I uh, mean, like with the with, with Adele, the, the impressive thing is because there are highly touted rookies and highly touted prospects in every organization. Um, the work ethic is the thing that jumps out because to come up, fail, and struggle, to go back down and then come back ready and and equipped with what you need, that's work ethic. And he's he, he did an interview um, in mid September. And I remember listening to it on my way home from the game. And uh, I think it was on Trent Rush's show. Um, and, and he said, they asked him about the minor leagues and, you know, statistics and getting through the minor leagues and getting promoted and the atmosphere in the minor leagues as you're working on your skills and like that. And he said, no, he said, look, he said, you know, Brandon and I are really tight. We've come up together. And we talked all the time about winning. We played every game to win. We didn't play every game to 
get two hits and uh, you know, hit a hit a ball 400 feet or, you know, do a skill that someone had been looking for. He said, we played to win. You know, we, we realized that we have to improve to do to win and, and the things that we're working on translate to winning. He said, but no, this wasn't just development. This ju- wasn't just, yeah, you know, I had a couple hits, so we had a good night. This was, we are going to win this game. We're playing to win. That really stood out to me because in the minor leagues right now, and, and even when I was there, it was about development and, and it can be, it's about development. But when you find those guys that just can't stand losing and are playing hard to, you know, win in triple A or double A at the end of a season or at the end of a long road trip, um, that's the stuff. I mean, that's the stuff you're looking for. I, I was really um, pleasantly, uh, not pleasantly surprised, but just pleased to hear that, 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 that he put such a value on winning in the minor leagues as a player who was had all kinds of tools and was, you know, figuring it out. That's awesome. Yeah. This is baseball and baseball, you don't get wins by a ta- or, you know, gaining talent that could help. But in baseball, you get wins by preaching a winning mentality. You know, I have a lot of Padres fans, friends. I grew up in San Diego and they were all like, well, we have all this talent. How are we losing? I'm like, well, you can't change a culture overnight. You cannot create a winning <laughs> culture in a week in baseball this is that's the beauty of baseball in basketball you can create a winning culture in a single season hell you know in a single week but in baseball it's a process and that's what i love about this game you know it's funny you say that because i remember talking uh bringing that point up to gooby um i don't think i I don't know if it was on the air or off there we were talking about the padres and i told them i said because i think i had a couple padre games in my games and i remember after i did my homework on them and prepared for them I just realized none of these guys are from here not, n- none of them came through that system the pitching staff the the position players and I'm not saying that that's that's going to sink you but you, you don't see that very much in the in the game um, even the really you know look at Houston and Oakland and uh, Boston sure they've got guys from other places but most of their guys have come through that system or developed or traded for as minor leaguers and, and came through. So I think the Padres are really talented. Uh, they're probably, they're obviously going to get a, a, another manager. Um, and I wouldn't dismiss them making a run next year, but I just found that interesting and in the dynamics of everybody's from someplace else. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I believe in some chemistry. I don't believe that it's the be all end all. I've been around teams that fought each other and hated each other and won but a lot of games. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> I, I always believe that chemistry isn't necessarily in the clubhouse. Chemistry is on the field. Chemistry is, okay, you can hate each other or not get along or you can't stand that guy. But when the first pitch is thrown or in any other sport, when the game begins, are you able to blend your skills with that person and show them that you're all about winning and, and, so I, I'm a big, I'm a believer that there's, the, there's more chemistry once the game starts and how guys fit together and play together. And if they have that burning desire to win, if they, you know, if they don't like each other uh, more times than not, they're going to find a way to win because that's what they want and that's what they like. Absolutely. All right. We're going to go ahead and uh, get close to wrapping up here. I, I, I really do appreciate the time. I know we're going way longer. So no, thank you right. so much. If you're so if you're the general manager of the Angels, what is your sales pitch to try to get a key name in here? You know, any key name, you know, what's your sales pitch to them? How are you going to get them to Anaheim if you were Perry Manassian? If I'm Perry Manassian, I do a couple things. You know, I, you know, look, Shohei Otani, Mike Trout's going to be healthy. Rendon's going to be healthy. Walsh is an all-star. Fletcher should have been an all-star and is going to be an all-star. Marsh and Adele are blossoming stars. Um, We we're we're going to get some pitching here, but I would do the other, the other thing I would do if I was Perry, I would say, and here, by the way, here's my resume. Here's where I've been. I was at the ground floor when Toronto started to build that really good postseason team that came very close to the world series you know, 15, 16, bat flip, Batista, all that fun stuff. Um, He was part of that. 
And then he point to the part where he went to Atlanta. Remember Atlanta in the mid, you know, 2014, 2015, um, 2016 uh, was, was a rebuild. I think they burned the forest except for Freddie Freeman. And within like a year or a year and a half, all of a sudden they were really good again. And they had traded for pitching. They had developed some pitching. Um, they had signed some pitching. Uh, and then the young, you know, and all of a sudden the Braves are perennial postseason teams. And the team that's headed to the National League Championship Series was part of a group. Alex Anthopoulos was the, the common thread in both. And so was Perry. Um, I think you sell them on that. I've been at, I've been in this position before. I've been at this juncture with two other organizations and look where those organizations ended up going. So I, I think that's a, Good answer. Um, I think that's a, uh, I think that's highly important for anyone that is looking towards where are the angels going and, and how are they going to get there? They've got a guy in my estimation and, and in just in looking at his body of work that's been at the ground floor of, of two of those. And, um, you know, this is his first general manager job, but I, I think every general manager came from somewhere and worked for somebody that influenced him. Um, you know, I look at a great example of that is Farhan Zaidi, right? Uh, Oakland, Billy Ball, or uh, not Billy Ball, Billy Bean. Mm -hmm. Billy Ball was when Billy Martin was there. That was a long time ago. But, uh, you know, Farhan Zaidi was there Oakland was always good at, at finding undervalued assets. That's the theme of Moneyball, whether it's, you know, that stat or that type of player or guys that were undervalued or underappreciated. Um, he goes to the Dodgers and, you know, all of a sudden the Justin Turners and the Mac Muncies and the Chris Taylors are showing up and suddenly their careers turn around. Um, he goes to San Francisco and now he's the guy and look at what the Giants have done in two years. They've, you know, the Yastrzemski's, the Solano's, the Gosman's, the, the, all of those guys have, have some of them. You're like, where I had no idea that Donovan Solano was a, a great player like this. Uh, you know, who knew that if you gave Yastrzemski a, a chance, he'd be this good. Um, I think you, you probably could have called that somewhat accurately when Farhan went from Oakland to Los Angeles. And you certainly knew it was coming when he went from Los Angeles to San Francisco. So, you know, for, for Perry to start in Toronto, then gone to Atlanta, both those teams, you know, uh, built to contend and into the postseason. Uh, I think he's a, the, the right guy, or at least if, if the scenario that you uh, just drew out, how do you convince someone that, that you're, you know, you got a chance to be really, really good. I think that's part of it. Good answer. Good answer. All right, so let's close on this. Vince Scully, Jerry Coleman, Dick Ambert. Honestly, the list goes on and on. Southern California has had some absolute iconic voices through lifetimes and generations. What does it feel like to be associated now with those Southern California names? Uh, it's really cool. I don't associate myself with those names to begin with. <laughs> um, you should. I, thank you. Uh, that's nice. Um, but look, it's, uh, it's one of the things in this business that you're, um, as you move up in, in, in I remember as, as a, I didn't really want to do this until I was 22, 23 years old. And then I started listening, you know, all, everybody as a kid in their backyard was narrating their game, right? Yeah. As, as a play by play. Absolutely. Everybody did that as a kid, even, you know, girls, boys, in the backyard, if it's football, it's like, I'm back to pass. And, and you have that crowd noise and it's, you know, yeah. even, even if your friends can't come over to play, you're still playing by yourself. You're throwing the ball against the garage and you're narrating it. Here's the, you know, the curve ball is a strike and he gets out of the jam or whatever. So once you get to 23 and you're, you want to be a broadcaster, then all of a sudden the voices you listen to the Bill Kings and, and people like that growing up, um, suddenly you, you take what you remember from them or that you could hear them now and you don't imitate them, but you emulate some of the things they do. Uh, you know, one of the best, and it's a painful memory for angel fans. Um, I remember my first year in the Meyer leagues, that postseason was the Red Sox angels, um, league championship series. And, and 
Al Michaels was doing play by play. And I remember as a had been a broadcaster for like two months or whatever, listening to Al Michaels and the way he reflected what was happening in the game in his calls to me was like, oh, that really resonates with me. I mean, the astonishment of first the surprise of Baylor's home run, then the astonishment of Hindu's home run and it, it, the, just in his voice. And then it was one of the great games in, in major league history because the angels rallied and the angels did a lot of great things in that, in that game as well. And just his ability to, to give the proper um, tone to each play, astonishing, unbelievable. Oh my God. How, how does that happen now? Um, that really resonated with me. Um, and, and to your point, I'll give you one story. The, the, one of the biggest thrills of my broadcasting career wasn't a game that I called and wasn't a play or a, a, an assignment or whatever. My first job in the big leagues was as a pre and post game host for the Seattle Mariners and a, and a fill in play by play announcer. Dave Niehaus was the guy that I'd fill in for and he's an angels. He and Enberg were angel guys long ago. And so, um, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area um, and lived in California my whole life. And um, Bill King at that time was the voice of the A's on radio, but he was the Raiders announcer and the Warriors announcer. When the Raiders moved to Los Angeles, I was one of the few that still was a huge Raider fan and would listen to Bill King and, and all of that. So my first road trip with the team was to Oakland. And, and you know, I spent six years in the minor leagues and obscurity and so here I am going to host the pregame show from Oakland and um, I'm standing behind the, the, the cage and I know Ken Korak really well because he was my partner in Las Vegas uh, at AAA and Ken is now is the long time just incredible radio voice of the athletics and so I remember going up to Ken and he's like oh Rich it's great to see you here and, and, I'm, and I'm like yeah, this is my first you know all that first road trip and I, I said that's Bill King and um, he goes, yeah. And I said, I want to go up and introduce myself to him because he's like a hero. Right. And so I yeah. walk over and Bill King is, you know, he's got the mustache, the, the beard. He looks like the devil. He's and he's got that great yeah. <laughs> all that. And, and I go over to him and he sees out of the corner of his eye that I'm coming over. So he kind of turns like this. And I said, you know, Mr. King, um, and I put out my hand. I'm uh, and he just before I said it, he looks at me, he goes, oh, hey, Rich, how are you? How's things going for you? How's the season in, in Seattle? And congratulations on getting yeah. the job and, and, and all of that. And I just was like, uh, uh, <laughs> and I, I you know, every I'm sure it was the most awkward, you know, 20. I was probably 27 at the time or 28. I'm sure it was the most awkward conversation uh, he'd heard in a while. <laughs> And I turned away, walking away, you know, not, not feeling, geez, I embarrassed myself. I turned away and I was like, Bill King knows who I am. Yeah. And I was awesome. like, oh, what a shot of um, adrenaline that was. And it was like, man, Bill King knows who I am. And, uh, you know, moments like that, that was a, just a huge moment for me. Um, so when you talk about how do you associate yourself with all the great Southern California broadcasters, don't forget Bob Miller. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bob oh, no, there's a long list. Trust me, I can keep going. Yeah. My first sport was hockey. I'd never seen a hockey game before in my life. Um, and I talked my way into a minor league hockey job. And I remember, <laughs> I don't know how I ran into him or how I, but he was so gracious and so nice at the, the one time I met him and he showed me, you know, tricks about here's how I organize players and, you know, and I remember sending him a tape and, him, him critiquing that that hockey tape and and later when I got to the big leagues a long time ago I, I think I sent him a note and stuff like that I never really ran into him after that because you know I didn't do the NHL or anything like that but you know just that little uh you know that day you know that that hour or whatever he spent with me was very impactful so um you know he's one of the guys that I think of when I think of great Los Angeles broadcasters along with you know, with Vin and, and um, Bob Starr and, and with the Angels. Oh, yeah, uh, I remember listening. Chick to him. Hearn, obviously, just great, iconic voices. Enberg, 
um, all those guys. So it's, it's, uh, it's really an honor. It's, a, and it's a, look, you know, to call a game, I've called games at Angel Stadium at the Big A a lot for the Mariners, for uh, the Marlins, for MLB Network, for um, the other, here's another, all right, this is the last one. Um, <laughs> my, fir my first job in the minor leagues was with the Spokane Indians. And the Spokane Indians were owned by the Brett brothers, Bobby, uh, Ken, George, and John Brett. Mm -hmm. So Bobby Brett was the guy that lived in Spokane. And Bobby was just a dear, great guy. And all the Brett brothers were just terrific. And, and so I was the voice of their baseball team and their hockey. They owned the hockey team too. So I was their guy for like two years. And I remember um, it was a short day. So the season started in June. So Bobby Brett said, hey, uh, he lived down in... Um, I believe it was Newport Beach at the time in a you know a nice place on the Strand or someplace. And he said, hey, why don't you come down to my place for a week and you can, you know, I'll let you use my scooter and you can go all over the place and do all kinds of stuff. And then maybe we'll go out to an Angels game and we'll go meet Kemmer. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Let's do it. And I'd never really been in a major league booth before. So I was down at Bobby's place. You know, the beach was there. He, I got to ride his scooter around town and stuff. So the night we went out to the ballpark, um, I met all the angels broadcaster. And I think Bob Starr was the, um, was the radio guy, the television guy. I forget, but, uh, Ken Brett was the analyst. So oh, yeah, I, yeah. Go, I got to go in the booth and I got to meet Ken and, and he's like, Oh yeah. Hey, you're our Spokane guy. Great. Da, 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 da. Um, that was awesome. Cause I remember looking at the big a and going, wow, wouldn't this be great to call a game here someday? Mm -hmm. Um, at go. the start at the start of my career i started to do once i got through the minor leagues and did the mariners and stuff i started to do national stuff for a variety of people but fs not fs1 it was fx had a game of the week and ken was the analyst and i got a call from an executive in la um early one week and said hey um we got a conflict can you do the thursday game in arizona it was mets arizona and i'd done espn stuff and so i done some national stuff and i'm like oh wow and he said and your analyst is ken brett <laughs> and i was like oh. and it it was so cool to share the booth i remember i was going to take a taxi to the to the ballpark from the hotel and ken comes into the lobby sees me and goes hey come on with me and so it's like oh but i called the cab and he goes i want a cab there was a limo hitting out and, and, and that was his. And he's like, yeah, come on, let's go. So I rode in the limo with Ken. I did the game with him. And it just, it was such a great moment because of all the, the struggles through the minor leagues, working for the Bretts and here I'm calling a game with, with him. And, you know, tragically that a few years later, he passed away with uh, cancer. Um, but I was just so thrilled then and glad now that I got a chance to, to work with him because I know that he was proud too, because here's a guy that was his minor league announcer that now is sitting next to him uh, in a big league booth that, that came into the booth at the big A, uh, wide-eyed. Wide and and um, that's a, those are my two cool stories, the Bill King story and the Ken Brett story. Those are definitely awesome. nice stories, yeah, because, I mean, the, the struggles of coming through, I mean, some guys don't get to, I mean, well, most people don't get to your level, obviously. So to have two awesome stories like that, that we much really appreciated you sharing those with us. Yeah, no, no, those are, um, that's the fun part about starting at the bottom and scratching your way to the top is the people that help you, the moments you have, the appreciation you have for ballparks, stadiums, arenas, you know, you know I, I did that. I did, did the wooden classic two years down in Anaheim and the best part of it wasn't the games. The best part of it was the day before where you sat with John Wooden for an hour or two and talked, you know, basketball. And she was like, this is John Wooden. And I'm, he knows my name. He knows, you know, my kids names now. And he next year, he remembers them and he remembers me. And it's like, what am I doing here? <laughs> so <laughs> Those are, those are all cool moments. Absolutely. Trust me. I have those. We Todd and I have those experiences doing this now. I mean, I never thought in a lifetime I'd be sitting here, you know, texting commentators and former baseball <laughs> players. It's, you know, like you said, when you and I were talking uh, privately, uh, life comes at you fast and uh, it's awesome. You know, it's, 
yeah. conversations like this that make uh, everything in life worth it. So uh, thank you so much. You went above and beyond with your time. We really do appreciate it. And uh, here's hoping we get to see each other in the big A or just around. But thank you so much for your time. It really was an honor. I um, hope so. And thanks. Thank you, uh, you know, for the invitation. Uh, thanks to all the Angel fans that w- were so kind to me uh, this year. And hopefully I'll see you next year. And what, but a real quick, uh, is there anything you want to plug or is there anywhere you, uh, uh, the fans can get a hold of you to, to, to uh, like, to... like a book or something like that? Well, here I am. I did anything. finish a book. Here it is. Uh, you know, and for nine ninety nine, you can get the angels media guide. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything. <laughs> I was going to say, how, how'd you do that? Hey, I'm, I'm ordering it right now. <laughs> I got, I got nothing to plug. Oh. Um, I got a football game, you know, I've got football for the next six weeks and I'll be down in Southern California a bunch. So uh, nothing to plug, just, uh, you know, happy to talk angels baseball tonight. Awesome. Well, again, like Fernando said, thank you so much for your time. It was, it wasn't the, uh, it was a fun year on some aspects, but we know winning cures all. And so hopefully this season will, will bring a better, better fortune, but we really enjoyed you in the broadcast booth, you and Gooby and Moda and the entire team. It was really nice. Yeah, to watch they, those, those two guys are really special, Jose and, and Mark, for sure. I don't mm-hmm. think I ever called him Mark. It's, I don't think he never gets called Mark. I think it's just Gooby. So yeah, he's, he's referred yeah, very to very underrated. Yeah. Very underrated. Yep. Criminally underrated. May I add a lot of people are like, you know, Gooby the, the baseball player. Like, no, you, you got to hear his commentating work. He's also yeah. great. Yep. Yeah. Without question. Rock star. Both he and Jose are rock stars. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. This has been a Halos in the Infield podcast with your host, Todd Fox and Fernando and Rich Waltz. Thank you so much again for uh, giving us your time. All right, guys. Thank you. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next summer. You got it. Take care. All right. Sounds Take great. care.